thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Ivan. Yeah, sorry for this slight delay. As you probably see here, I have like this big setup over here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if this is still going to work because it requires some time to set up, but uh, hopefully the demo gods will be with me and uh, this will work in the end. Um, anyway, so if you allow me to talk a little bit about myself, uh, Ivan already mentioned that I'm uh, a host of the Virtual Jug, especially the Book Reading Club. Um, but other than that, I'm mostly a passionate developer with um, uh, 10 years of experience in the Java world. I work mostly working with the finance, health, and government sectors. Uh, I, I do run my own blog on rodcortez.com. I also run my uh, YouTube videos uh, when I do some Java tips, um, do conference speaking. Uh, so if you want to reach me on any of those channels, please feel free to uh, go to my Twitter account, my email, and ask me something I'll be happy to help you with. Um, I usually like to have my sessions uh, really, really, really interactive, so uh, I really don't like to keep questions to the end. So please feel free to interrupt me anytime you want and ask me something. Just raise your hand and I'll try. We have like a big room here, so I may not be able to uh, see if you're calling me, but try yell from me like a boot or a cell phone, whatever, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. If not, we also have a Q&A in the end, but feel free to interrupt me anytime you want. Yes, yeah, so for our agenda for today, uh, we're going to uh, look into a little bit what MicroProfile is, uh, a little bit about Jcash's wall. Uh, we're going to do a demo with these Raspberry Pis that I, I have over here, hopefully. Uh, and then we're going to discuss a little bit about uh, MicroProfile future and uh, what we have in the, in the makings for that. So before diving in into, into the session itself, um, who here is using microservices to develop stuff? Yeah, no, not that many. So I'm going to ask in a different way. Who here will like to develop microservice approach in their uh, current work? OK, so more, more harms getting raised. So uh, microservice is something that's uh, kind of like a buzzword. And not, well, uh, buzzword in a way that uh, is something that uh, our industry is looking uh, very, very, with very attention. And uh, a lot of people already using this uh, new style of developing uh, software um, in, their, in their industries. So uh, it's, it's, it makes sense that we start to look some of these things in the, into the Java E world as well. Um, so what is actually MicroProfile? Does anyone here, have you ever heard about MicroProfile before? A few people? So. Uh, that's great. So that's why I, I hope that you're here to learn about MicroProfile. So MicroProfile, uh, you can find uh, you can find it in MicroProfile.io. And MicroProfile is actually an initiative to actually bring the microservices world to the Java E world. Um, as you probably know, or probably uh, if you've been like a Java E uh, developer. So also, who's here using Java E? Yeah, most of the room. Uh, so there is like this uh, misconcep misconception that uh, Java E is something very heavyweight, and maybe that was true uh, 10 years ago, um, but that's not true anymore. Um, and anyway, the, these microservices, um, or this microprofile initiative was brought up into the E world, uh, basically for the Java E has an answer to uh, this uh, new development style of technology which is the microservices. So instead of us having a, this very big uh, spec uh, on Java E6, Java E7, and Java E8, uh, actually MicroProfile is only a small set of uh, the Java E specs that's comp compromised with CDI, uh, JAXRS, and JSONP. Why these, only these three uh, implementations? That's because that's the, the, the ones that we think that they are essentially required to develop a microservice and nothing else. Um, and finally, uh, one of the last things that uh, the initiative is trying to, to make is actually uh, to uh, support portability across different environments of the different vendors that are uh, involved in the microprofile initiative. So I, I, I would like to also show you this, uh, this graph. I'm, I, I actually went to each uh, e-spec and tried to count how many uh, implementations, how many specs that are out there. And basically for e5, we have 24. 
is 630 and, and basically keeps growing and growing. So most likely in, in, our, old, all, in our own development, or the, the current development that we are doing, we're definitely not using all of these specs. So it makes sense that we start with something much smaller, and then if we need something bigger, then we can, we can use the full-blown spec. But um, I mean, 39 specs for E8, I mean, that I'm not definitely I'm not going to use all of them. So microprofile means, might be something interesting to look at. OK, so how about implementations? Um, maybe, maybe it's, uh, um, uh, if you look into this list over here, we actually see that most of the vendors for uh, the Java EE also support MicroProfile. So Tommy uh, from Apache is also is supporting MicroProfile, WebSphere from IBM, Wildfly from Red Hat, uh, Payara uh, for Glassfish, or the, the, implementation, the, 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 the vendor implementation for, for Glassfish, and Komuzu EE. So we have all these different vendors that are supporting MicroProfile right now. So if you want to try it, you just download any of those, those, those servers and, and try them out. Um, an interesting thing is when I talk to you about portability, uh, these vendors also have uh, this initiative where they built um, a repository of a project, which actually is a, a conference project where they, we have several modules, like uh, the attendees module, the speakers module, and so on. And it's done in a way that each model is actually implemented in, it to, in a different uh, vendor uh, server. So basically, when you boot up uh, the entire thing, all, the, all these models are going to be deployed on all different servers, and all of them talk with each other. So basically, it's to prove the portability of uh, the, the micro profile. And you can see that basically, if you want to change your implementation from Tommy to Wildfly, it's just it's easy to do. If you want to do the other way, it's also easy to do. So that's something that the vendors are heavily investing to uh, have a very good portability between a micro profile um, implementation. Now, let's look a little bit about in, in CDI. So who here has used CDI? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people. So I'm not going to go into uh, very hard details. It's just um, to uh, see what, what we have on CDI because of the micro profile uh, implementation. Uh, so CDI is Contest Dependency Injection for Java E platform. Uh, it provides a bean lifecycle and type safety injection. Um, you're able to have your own producers to uh, create your own objects and have uh, a CDI manage their lifecycle. They also have some interceptors uh, so that you can use, observers, and so on. So nothing really fancy over there. JAXRS, probably the most used spec uh, after CDI. Well, I'm not sure which one it is, but who's here using JAXRS? Yeah, a lot of people. So this is uh, um, the most natural way to implement microservices is using a, a REST implementation. And for Java E, it's JAXRS. So it's uh, mostly annotation centers uh, or annotation based, and it's uh, everything around HTTP. Um, Finally, uh, most people will use JSON to uh, convey the information between a microservice uh, uh, implementation. So JSONP, it's a good candidate for that. Uh, Basic is used to parse and transform uh, JSON for your responses or to, for your uh, input for the microservices. Uh, it also has a stream API and an object model API that you can use to build your, your objects as you want. Um, so, if you look here in this, this simple, really, really simple piece of code, uh, basically this is just a few lines of code that allows us to build this really simple microservice. So it's just like a, a, a method that does a get, which is defined to a data store, it doesn't matter where it is. It will grab a movie, it will uh, do the JSON representation of that movie, and then we'll return a response. So it's uh, when usually people tell me that uh, Java E, uh, it's very complicated, it's uh, very verbose, and so on. Uh, I usually so show them this this sample, and I mean it's really really small. Uh, maybe JSON Object Builder could be smaller in in the name, but uh, some implementations on you might even use Chax uh, Chax B um, to bind the data directly, so you don't have to use this, but. To demonstrate all the free specs, I prefer to use this, this, this example. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. 
Um, now going, going to, shake, to, to, to Jcash. So Jcash is uh, something that's been discussed for several years. Um, it only went uh, final three years ago, I believe, 2004, I think, or 2005. Um, and it's been discussed for over 10 years. Um, uh, and basically, you actually got it, and now we're trying to use it with, uh, with our own stuff. So it's very simple to use, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate here uh, to use the Jcash with our micro profile. Um, basically, it's composed with a caching provider that allows you to pick an implementation of Jcash to use at runtime, um, a cache manager to manage the cache. So basically, to have like uh, multiple caches with multiple names, so you can store them in different ways. Uh, the cache itself and an entry um, to store the cache. So the, the, the easiest way you can look into actually the, 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 the Jcache is it's almost like a Java map. So it has a, a key and has a value and you can retrieve values from that map and you can put ma ma values on that map and you can delete them. So it's very easy and I'll show them uh, in a sec. So this is all how you will get uh, an object put into the cache. So you'll just get the caching provider. This will get you the, the default one. If you want uh, uh, a specific one, you'll have to indicate the full qualified name on the get caching provider method. It's also have a, uh, a method to do that. Uh, you get the cache manager. You get the cache. Um, so here you're using cache object object, but it might be string string, object string, whatever. Uh, objects that you want to use over there. Then you just do a put, and you're able to do a get. So it works exactly as a map, but a little bit more complex than that, of course. <laughs> so for Jcash and MicroProfile, it's really easy to uh, bind them together. So I'll just add a jar on my lib folder. Uh, at this time, we're going to use uh, Azelcast uh, implementation of Jcash. Um, and we're also going to use a, a CDI extension so we can map our Jcash stuff uh, into our project. Sorry? Uh, someone say something? Okay. Uh, I thought I should hear something. Sorry. Okay. What about Tommy? So Tommy is the server we're going to run uh, this. So Tommy is actually Tomcat with Java E. Who heard about Tommy before? Uh, a lot of people. So thank you so much for your support. Um, basically, Tommy was built with the OpenHIB community to offer a lightweight um, alternative to uh, Tomcat um, and provide the Java implementation. So of course, Tommy is a micro profile, implements a micro profile specification, including JAXRS, CDI, and JSNP. Uh, and of course, all the other specifications of Java E. So if you want to use something that's microprofile, you can use Tommy on any of the other servers. But for this example, I'll, I'll just going to stick with Tommy. OK, so for this Py setup that I have over here, and I'm not exactly sure if this is going to work, so I hope, hopefully it will. Um, what I have over here is um, two clusters. These are represented by these uh, colors. Um, boxes. So the red ones are actually running HA proxy, which are load balancing data to these orange ones. It's actually running the microservice um, Tommy 7 for micro profile on these two uh, orange boxes. So there are two servers. So red one is load balancing for these two. And the purple one is actually running MySQL as a database and data store. Here, exactly the same. Um, and the black ones, I also have an HA, HA proxy. And the other three are basically are just clients that are calling the endpoints that are running on, on, on these. So hopefully, if everything will, will be OK, we'll be able to see the difference between Jcash uh, on, the, on the implementation and no Jcash on the, on the, on the, on the servers. So um, before going into that, let's, let's look into some code. Are you guys able to see it like that? Yes? yes? OK, awesome. OK, so in here I'll have 
Um, so this is my, 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 this movie rest this is my rest endpoint. So what I have over here is, uh, as the sample I showed you before, it's just a, a simple app called Movie App. Basically it allows you to list movies, create movie, uh, find movie, uh, update, delete, so just like a crude for movies, nothing uh, fancy. So here's my rest endpoint uh, using CDI and Jackson REST annotation, so I think this is pretty uh, straightforward. Um, and now for the, for the cache part, what I'm going to do here, oops, okay. I have this persistence layer uh, where I'm actually injecting my cache over here. So remember that code that I showed you earlier where I was doing everything programmatically? So in here I'm actually using um, a cache producer so I'm able to uh, inject the cache directly. So that's that's something easy that I could do. I'll just have like something called a cache factory uh, that's going to produce uh, a cache when I use the annotation movie cache. So this movie cache annotation is something that I, that I, I just created as well. Um, nothing fancy, so just something that I define a name over there. And uh, now here on my, my factory, I'll just, uh, I can just inject the cache manager um, and then produce the cache if uh, I'm able to get uh, an injection field with the movie cache. I'll just get the cache with that uh, name that comes from the notation. Um, I'm just setting here some configuration on the cache, which is just like a policy for expiration. After one hour, it just expires the cache. Uh, I can do whatever other things I want here with the configuration. It doesn't really matter. Create the cache, then return the cache. So. Uh, very straightforward. So this actually allows me to now on my movie beans, I'm able to inject a cache and, and get it over here. But that's, that's, not, uh, that's not complete yet. So even if I have the cache object, let's just say here for my find object, uh, if I want to put something on the cache, I will probably have to retrieve it first here from uh, my data store, like this. Then I'll, okay, I have my uh, results cache. Oh, no, not that one. And then I'll probably have to do like uh, put. I'll pick up the key. I'll say it, that's the, um, the ID of the movie. And then I'll do the, put the movie over there. So it's kind of like noisy on the code. So we have, we have to explicitly uh, write this code to put stuff on the cache. But that's, there is a better alternative, which is um, a Jcash CDI extension. Uh, so on, uh, when, when uh, Jcash was released, they also released an, um, an API, which are a set of annotations that don't have an implementation, so these are vendor-based implementations uh, that allow you to place annotations on the methods and actually cache the method result directly without having to uh, do um, programmatic um, call so you can to actually cache the result. So what we can do here instead of having this, we could, uh, so let's put this how it was before, we can do this annotation called cache result, and then I'll just have a, a name for the cache called movie, uh, movie uh, by ID, doesn't matter. And basically what this annotation will do is, let me put this in the middle of the screen, um, this will uh, try to find uh, a cache entry on, on the cache name by the cache key that's here on the, on the method parameter. So if it's able to find something, it will return directly from the cache. If not, it's going to uh, call the method, it's going to return the method call, and then it's going to put the method uh, result into cache again. So basically, in here on the first call, this, the method will be called on the second call and uh, later calls then just the cache uh, result will get uh, returned unless the cache expires or I'll remove something on the cache and, or something else. So that, that's the way that now I'm able to have a cleaner code uh, just by using this annotation and caching the, the, the result over there. Uh, let's see a couple of other examples. So in here, uh, this is a more complex uh, example. So I have like these find uh, or get movies that's going to find the list of movies. So I have like multiple um, parameters over there. 
So what the, the, the cache result is going to do, it's just going to uh, grab all the arguments from the method call. It's going to create the key with all the arguments. Uh, basically, if I say integer first result one, max result one, string field, whatever, so it's going to create the cache key with all the parameters that I pass into the method call, and then it's going to cache the result. So if I do a, a second method call with different arguments, then it's going to do another cache entry, and so, so on and so forth. So basically, if, if you call the method again with the same arguments, uh, the cache is smart enough to understand that you're doing the same call again uh, based on the key, and will retrieve the, the value from the cache and then return uh, the value directly uh, instead of uh, doing all, the, all this call altogether. Um, so we do, we do have other, other, um, other annotations that you can use. So cache put is something also very interesting. So let's just say, let me just add the imports over here. Okay. So cache put actually allows you to um, put something into the cache and then define what will be the key, the, the, the key for the cache. So if you don't use the, the, this cache key generator that I have over there, what cache will do, we'll, try, we'll use the, the, the method argument as the cache key. But as you can see here, my, my argument is a movie, so maybe I don't want to have, use a movie, uh, because movie is like a big object, and so all stuff over there doesn't really uh, make uh, much sense to use it as the cache key. So what I actually want to, to use is the ID of the movie as the cache key. So for me to use that, I'll just implement a cache key generator which is this class over here. Uh, basically, uh, it's just an interface that you implement as one method called generate cache key. Um, then you basically, you're on this cache key invocation context, you're able, you have an access to the invocation parameters of the method that's been cached. And basically, you're able to get the movie from there, as I'm getting over here. So uh, getting all the parameters of the method, iterating all of them, if uh, just doing some uh, uh, safety checks here to make sure that the uh, argument is actually a movie, then I have to cast it, of course, and finally I'll just return a, a new default generated cache key, which is only the movie ID over here. So this is a way uh, for me to override the method arguments cache values uh, for the keys, um, and instead of using the movie as the cache key, I'll just use uh, the ID, or I can use a combination of uh, other fields over here. So uh, this is uh, uh, an array of objects, so I can put whatever I want here. So let's just say uh, I want also to use the the title of the movie. So I can I can just do a compose cache key over here with the ID of the movie and the title of the movie. Uh, okay, let's return over there. Um, so, this I'm using for the add, for the edit. Um, and of course, you also have um, a cache remove annotation. So, this actually will remove an entry from the cache um, just by using the annotation on the method. If you notice over here, what I have is actually an ID already, so I don't, I'm not passing a movie to my delete uh, movie method. So this means that I don't need to have like a cache key generator to generate the right key for the cache to know which uh, cache entry to remove from the cache. So since the ID is over here, and I already know that uh, my cache name is movie ID, which is the same that's uh, being used on the add movie and the edit movie methods, then uh, the, the, the implementation is smart enough to understand, okay, I have an argument ID which is type long, the cache entry uh, or the cache key entry is uh, type long, so I'm just going to remove it from the cache uh, because I just remove uh, from, from the data store. Okay, almost out of battery, and this is not good. Uh, it, this should be plugged in, but it wasn't. Okay. Um, Yes. Uh, sorry? Uh, 
Uh, for the cache remove annotation, uh, mm -hmm. if the key is generated, how we can remove that movie? From yeah, so cache. basically if the key generator, the cache remove key also accepts um, uh, a cache key generator. So let's just say that, uh, let's just say that here on the elite movie, you'll have a, you'll just accept a movie over here, right? And this thing here, you'll just say uh, movie, uh, get ID. Uh, yeah, I'm using the same name over there. Let me put it like this. Um, and now here on the cache key generator, I'll, I may, I'm able to use the same cache key generator that I use on the other uh, methods like this. So in here, uh, basically, when the cache gets invoked, the cache key generator will get invoked to retrieve the right key, and then uh, it will go for this code that I showed earlier. It will get the key, uh, the ID, and then will remove the cache by the ID. Uh, does that make sense? Awesome. Okay, so uh, then I have like uh, other methods over here for count, also doing cache results, doing uh, cache names for other, using different kind of cache names. Um, so basically this is what I, I want to show regarding cache, so it's very easy to uh, add a cache to your um, a micro profile project or any other project for, for that matter. Um, so now let's see if uh, the demo codes are with me and let's see if this works. <laughs> okay, and these are green, which is good. These are also green, which is also good. And these are green, which is also awesome. So let me, let's do a refresh over here. Okay, I think we're good. Let's do another refresh. Okay, so what I also have over here is a dashboard that's running on Kibana and Elasticsearch. Uh, so one of the other things that this cluster is doing is publishing some metrics from the cluster into this Elk instance. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about metrics in the future as well, because that's something that uh, MicroProfile also wants to um, uh, implement. And this is also this is our um, uh, our suggestion or our idea of what the metrics should should look like uh, for uh, a micro microservice approach or microservice architecture. So for me to uh, explain a little bit what's happening over here, are you guys able to see it properly? Okay. So actually, I'm not going to uh, deploy anything to, the, to these uh, pies at the moment. So as I mentioned, they are running Tommy. Another interesting thing is all of them are running on Docker. So there I'm using Docker and Ansible to deploy everything over there. Um, and basically, I have on both clusters, one is named Grom, another one is named Trowel. Uh, one is actually running the, the code that I'll show you with cache stuff in it, and the other one is not. So Gram is running with cache. Um, so let's filter. Um, let's filter Gram first. And if I'll see over here, then I see that my average response time for my micro uh, service is actually 0.17 seconds, or uh, 17 seconds. No, 0.17 uh, seconds. Um, and if I scroll a little bit uh, to the bottom, I actually see that. I have here a graph that shows me the database statements that are being uh, issued to my database, which is empty. It's empty because there are no uh, queries being done at all at the moment, because everything's being cached. So if I actually go here again, and now go to uh, my other data center, which is Troll, I'm now able to see that the average response time is a little bit higher. So uh, 0.3 seconds. And if I uh, scroll here to the bottom, now I see that I have this database statement uh, graph. It's full of queries that are being executed on that particular cluster. So now I'm able to see that uh, actually the cache has impact and really uh, improved the performance 
and it was really easy to uh, implement on my microservice code. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So I'm really happy that this actually works. So if I do a couple of more refreshes, you'll see that the data should be getting updated. So 571 request counts, um, 570. So just going to uh, update them all the time, 564. So when, when, when usually when people tell me that uh, Java is very heavyweight, I'll just show you this, this setup. So I'm actually able to run all this setup on, on Raspberry Pis. And the other thing I tell them, hey, I'm pretty sure that your uh, Chrome tab is occupying more memory than your application server. Yeah, that's true. So if, uh, let's see here. If I go here to my monitor and see what, how many, so Chrome, yeah, so if you see Chrome, all the tabs are like, all of these are roughly almost one gig, right? The servers are running on like 100 meg. So, okay, so we're done with this. Um, let's move a little bit to our presentation again. So all the setup that you have over here you can find it in this microprofile jcash github uh, repo. So all the code that I've showed so far, all the setup that's done for the pies, all the Ansible scripts, all the Docker images, you're able to find them there. So if you, if you feel bored and you want to um, do something like this, um, you'll be able to find all the setup over here. And if something doesn't work, uh, please let me know. I'll be happy to, to fix it on, or, or help you. Um, I'll just tell you another, another cool advantage of this is that it's really useful and it's really cool to test stuff. So because I can just come over here and I can just disconnect some cables and then I'm able to see what's happening on my, on my cluster as well. So it's kind of hard to do this when you're using VMs or using a, um, an AWS uh, environment, right? And this setup only costs like $500 or something. So instead of like paying huge amounts of uh, uh, Amazon credits, I'm able to just uh, do it over here. So just going to show you one, one thing. So actually you can see that that's actually working. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which cluster I did disconnect, but if I refresh over here, um, now you'll see that a while ago, like the data centers were like 50-50 and now all the traffic is going to one of the other data centers because I disconnected the HA proxy that's over here, so it's not uh, responding to requests anymore. So actually, I disconnected Chrome. Uh, so if I refresh it for a little while, then I'm still getting requests from, from the last minute. So now uh, the other data center is almost non-existent because it's not answering to any requests because it's not over there. And of course, if I connect the cable again, I should be able to see, um, so it's back up. And if I refresh this again, now you're going to see that the, the traffic starts increasing on that data center again. So it's, it's really useful to test stuff like load balancing, uh, session replications, uh, uh, everything that's uh, around with um, with multiple machines, multiple boxes, it's really cool to test. So, I really, I really recommend uh, to have a setup like this at home if you if you're able to to do it. Okay, so uh, continuing with the with the presentation, um, as I mentioned, this uh, GitHub repo you can find all the information about this. So, what's what's next for MicroProfile? So, there are a couple of other specifications that are in progress at the moment. Uh, we have a configuration uh, spec, a metric spec, that's why I wanted to show it here as well, and the health checks. Um, so why are these specifications important? Especially because when you're in a microservices uh, world, and you have, it's not like you have your um, a big monolith where you just monitor one box. You have to monitor like uh, a huge amount of boxes. You might, some, some people might have 
20, 30, 50, 100 microservices? Are you going to uh, manage and, and uh, monitor all of that? What if one of the microservices is down? How are you going to pinpoint what it is? So um, this is one of our um, uh, proposals for the metric stuff, so you're able to see what's actually happening on the, on the data center or, or whatever servers you're using. So for configuration, uh, it's going to be really simple, or at least the proposal it's, uh, wants to have something simple, which is you're going to have a microprofile config that properties on, on the app. Uh, you might have uh, also um, environment properties, so basically in microconfig.properties you'll set up whatever configuration that you want, and then you'll be able to override them via environment variables or system properties on JVM as well. Um, and then you're able to plug in uh, different config sources. So this doesn't make much sense if I don't show a little bit of code. So this, will, this is how it's going to look like, hopefully. Uh, you'll use CDI to inject uh, a configuration property. So the configuration property will be the property name that you'll set up on the, on the config file. Um, then you're able to override it in the environment variable or the system property as well. Um, so just to inject. On, uh, on, on the field that you want, and then you're able to get the, the, the value from that property. So you also provide a way that you're able to do programmatic lookup. So you do a config provider dot uh, get config, and then you're able to get the value uh, using the property name. So we, we do believe that uh, config is something very important on the microservices world as well, because we know that we always have uh, configuration requirements where you have to config stuff like host name, if, I don't know, uh, uh, whatever configuration we need to for, 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 for our application. So it's, I think it's very useful to have something like this. There was like some discussions to have it also on the Java e world or the Java e spec, the, the full-blown Java e 8. Uh, it was being discussed, it was, go, it was going to be uh, included in Java 8, but didn't got uh, approved, so maybe on Java 9. But for now, at least a microprofile spec is going to be there, or uh, in, the, in the next version at least. Uh, for metrics, so metrics, uh, uh, the idea is to have a REST endpoint that the uh, microprofile implementation is going to uh, provide. Um, the idea is to expose the endpoint on a slash matrix uh, name, and then uh, you're able to get different uh, values from, from that endpoint. Uh, so then using the options on the, on the call, you're able to get uh, metadata regarding that uh, endpoint. So for me, again, to show you a little bit how that, that looks like, uh, so if you do like a get with slash matrix slash CPU, you should get something like this. So it's, this is still being discussed, this is not yet final, but you're able to see like uh, what's the, the, the percentage of CPU being used, idle times, um, and some other more information. Another example is uh, if you do with, with an options, then you're able to see that for the sys time percent, the unit is a percentage uh, and has a, has a description. So basically, this is just metadata that's uh, associated with the endpoint that you call. So when you, when basically you go over this and you know exactly what the values refer to. Um, so this this is a proposal only uh, yet, but it shouldn't be uh, too far from this. Um, then health checks. So. We, we also need to know if our microservice is also running all the time, right? Because uh, usually when you have a microservice architecture, you have like all these microservices uh, calling each other, and sometimes you have like multiple calls. We have one service that calls three or four, and then if one is down, then one of them is going to fail. So it's a, it's a pain. So of course, we you have to have a way to measure the health of our cluster or measure the health of our system. So the idea here is to specify an endpoint as well, where you have a slash else uh, Jack Thrust endpoint to report the server health. Uh, and basically, it just reports uh, how the server is doing. Um, so let's, let's see an example over here. So if you do get slash health, it should report something like an outcome, it's up, yeah, it's working. And then it does some checks, like uh, uh, disk space and memory and stuff like that. So 
Um, just out of curiosity, who here hasn't got a machine that got down because it went out of disk space? Yeah, come on, don't be shy. You can, you can recognize that. Sorry? <laughs> Forever. Not, doesn't need to be this week. Yeah, so of course the idea here to include the, 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 um, the free bytes on our disk is to actually see, and, uh, okay, I'm running out of disk space because my logs are occupying too much or whatever. Uh, so basically it's for you to have a, a way to make sure that uh, your app is running just fine, and then you can have an alert system built on top of this so to warn you if the uh, disk space is running low or something like that. We, the idea is also to offer a programmatic API where you can just do like health status uh, do a name on the disk space and get the attribute uh, directly. So this kind of concludes what I uh, propose to present uh, to you guys. Um, I'm open for questions if you want, but uh, I really like to thank all of you for attending and for having me here. <laughs>